Chapter 12. Everyone behaved with complete presence of mind. Hey, folks, we're starting. Twelve. Everyone behaved with complete presence of mind. Brinker shouted that Phineas must not be moved. Someone else, realizing that only a night nurse would be at the infirmary, did not waste time going there, but rushed to bring Dr. Stanpole from his house. Others remembered that Phil Latham, the wrestling coach, lived just across the common and that he was an expert in first aid. It was Phil who, had, who made Finney stretch out on one of the wide, shallow steps of the staircase and kept him still until Dr. Stanpole arrived. The foyer and the staircase of the first building were soon as crowded as at midday. Phil Latham found the main light switch and all the marble blazed up under full illumination, but surrounding it was the stillness of near midnight in a country town so that the hurrying feet and the repressed voices had a hollow reverberance. The windows, blind and black, retained their look of dull emptiness. Once Brinker turned to me and said, go back to the assembly room and see if there's any kind of blanket on the platform. I dashed back up the stairs, found a blanket and gave it to Phil Latham. He carefully wrapped it around Phineas. I would have liked very much to have done that myself. It would have meant a lot to me, but Phineas might begin to curse me with every word he knew. He might lose his head completely. He would certainly be worse off for it, so I kept out of the way. He was entirely conscious, and from the glimpses I caught of his face, seemed to be fairly calm. Everyone behaved with complete presence of mind, and that included Phineas. When Dr. Stanpole arrived, there was silence on the stairs. Wrapped tightly in his blanket, with light flooding down on him from the chandelier, Finney lay isolated at the center of a tight circle of faces. The rest of the crowd looked on from above or below on the stairs, and I stood on the lower edge. Behind me, the foyer was now empty. After a short, silent examination, Dr. Stanpole had a chair brought from the assembly room, and Finney was lifted ca cautiously into it. People aren't ordinarily carried in chairs in New Hampshire, and as they raised him up, he looked very strange to me like some tragic and exalted personage, a stricken pontiff. Once again, I had the desolating sense of having all al along ignored what was finest in him. Perhaps it was just the incongruity of seeing him aloft and stricken, since he was by nature someone who carried others. I didn't think he knew how to act or even how to feel as the object of help. He went past with his eyes closed and his mouth tense. I knew that normally I would have been one of those carrying the chair, saying something in his ear as we went along. My aid alone had never seemed to him in the category of health. The reason for this occurred to me as the procession moved slowly across the brilliant foyer to the doors. Phineas had thought of me as an extension of himself. Dr. Stanpole stopped near the doors, looking for the light switch. There was an interval of a few seconds when no one was near him. I came up to him and tried to phrase my question, but nothing came out. I couldn't find the word to begin. I was being torn irreconcilably between is he and what is when Dr. Stanpole without appearing to notice my tangle, said conversationally, it's the leg again, broken again, but a much cleaner break, I think, much cleaner, a simple fracture. He found the light switch and the foyer was plunged into darkness. Outside, the doctor's car was surrounded by boys while Finney was being lifted inside it by Phil Latham. Phil and Dr. Stanpole then got into the car and drove slowly away, the headlights forming a bright parallel as they receded down the road and then swinging into another parallel at right angles to the first as they turned into the infirmary driveway. The crowd began to thin rapidly. The faculty had at last heard that something was amiss in the night and several alarmed and alarming masters materialized in the darkness and ordered the students to their dormitories. Mr. Ludsbury loomed abruptly out of the background of the shrubbery. Get along to the dormitory, Forrester, he said with a dry certainty in my obedience, which suddenly struck me as funny, definitely funny. Since it was beneath his dignity to wait and see that I actually followed his order, I was by not budging free of him a moment later. I walked into the bank of shrubbery, circled past trees in the direction of the chapel, doubled back along a large building donated by the alumni, which no one had ever been able to put to use, recrossed the street and walked noiselessly up the emerging grass next to the infirmary driveway. Dr. Stanpole's car was at the top of it, headlights on and motor running empty. I idly considered stealing it in the way that people idly consider many crimes it would be possible for them to commit. I took an academic interest in the thought of stealing the car, knowing all the time that it would be not so much criminal as meaningless, a lapse into nothing, an escape into nowhere. As I walked past it, the motor was throbbing with wheezy reluctance. 
prep school doctors don't own very desirable getaway cars, I remember thinking to myself. And then I turned the corner of the building and began to creep along behind it. There was only one window lighted at the far end and opposite it, I found some thin shrubbery which provided enough cover for me to study the window. It was too high for me to see directly into the room, but after I made sure that the ground had softened enough so that I could jump without making much noise, I sprang as high as I could. I had a flashing glimpse of a door at the other end of the room, opening on the corridor. I jumped again, someone's back. Again, nothing new. I jumped again and saw a head and shoulders partially turned away from me. The Lathams, this was the room. The ground was too damp to sit on, so I crouched down and waited. I could hear their blurred voices droning monotonously through the window. If they do nothing worse, they're going to bore Finney to death, I said to myself. My head seemed to be full of bright remarks this evening. It was cold, crouching motionless next to the ground. I stood up and jumped several times, not so much to see the room as to warm up. The only sounds were occasional snorts from the engine of Dr. Stample's car when it turned over with special reluctance and a thin, lonely whistling the wind sometimes made high in the still bare trees. These formed the background for the dull hum of talk in Finney's room as Phil Latham, Dr. Stample, and the night nurse worked over him. What could they be talking about? The night nurse had always been the biggest windbag in the school, Miss Windbag R.N. Phil Latham, on the other side, hardly ever spoke. One of the few things he said was, give it the old college try. He thought of everything in terms of the old college try, and he had told students to attack their studies, their sports, religious wavering, sexual maladjustments, physical handicaps, and a constellation of other problems with the old college try. I listened tensely for his voice. I listened so hard that I nearly differentiated it from the others, and it seemed to be saying, Finny, give that bone the old college try. I was, a card I was quite a card tonight myself. Phil Latham's college was Harvard although I had heard that he only lasted there a year. Probably he had said to someone to give something the old college try, and that had finished him. That would probably be grounds for expulsion at Harvard. There couldn't possibly be such a thing as the old Harvard try. Could there be the old Devon try? The old Devon endeavor? The decrepit Devon endeavor? That was good, the decrepit Devon endeavor. I'd use that sometime in the butt room. That was pretty funny. I bet I could get a rise out of Finney with Dr. Stanpole was fairly gabby too. What was he always saying? Nothing. Nothing? Well, there must be something he was always saying. Everybody had something, some words, some phrase that they were always saying. The trouble with Dr. Stanpole was that his vocabulary was too large. He talked in a huge circle. He probably had a million words in his vocabulary and he had to use them all before he started over again. That's probably the way they were talking in there now. Dr. Stanpole was working his way as fast as possible around his big circle. Miss Windbag was gasping out something or other all the time, and Phil Latham was saying, give her the old college try, Finney. Phineas, of course, was answering them only in Latin. I nearly laughed out loud at that. Gallia est omnes divisa in partes tres. Finney probably answered that whenever Phil Latham spoke. Phil Latham would look rather blank at that. Did Finney like Phil Latham? Yes, of course he did, but wouldn't it be funny if he suddenly turned to him and said, Phil Latham, you're a boob. That'd be funny in a way. And what about if he said, Dr. Stanpole, pal, you're the most long-winded licensed medical man alive. And it would be even funnier if he interrupted that night nurse and said, Miss Windbag, you're rotten, rotten to the core. I just thought I had to tell you. It would never occur to Finney to say any of those things, but they struck me as so outrageous that I couldn't stop myself from laughing. I put my hand over my mouth. Then I tried to stop my mouth with my fist. If I couldn't get control of this laughing, they would hear me in the room. I was laughing so hard it hurt my stomach and I could feel my face getting more and more flushed. I dug my teeth into my fist to try to gain control. And then I noticed that there were tears all over my hand. The engine of Dr. Stanpole's car roared exhaustedly. The headlights turned in an erratic arc away from me. And then I heard the engine laboriously recede into the distance and I, dis and I continued to listen until not only had it ceased, but my memory of how it sounded had also ceased. The light had gone out in the room and there was no sound coming from it. The only noise was the peculiarly bleak whistling of the wind through the upper branches. There was a street light behind me somewhere through the trees and the windows of the infirmary dimly reflected it. I came up close beneath the window of Finney's room, found a foothold on a grating beneath it, straightened up so that my shoulders were at a level with the window sill reached up with both hands, and since I was convinced that the window would be stuck shut, I pushed it hard. 
The window shot up and there was a startled rustling from the bed in the shadows. I whispered, Binny, sharply into the black room. Who is it? He demanded, leaning out from the bed so that the light fell waveringly on his face. Then he recognized me and I thought at first he was going to get out of bed and help me through the window. He struggled clumsily for such a length of time that even my mind, shocked and slowed as it had been, was able to formulate two realizations, that his leg was bound so that he could not move very well, and that he was struggling to unleash his hate against me. I came to, you want to break something else in me? Is that why you're here? He thrashed wildly in the darkness, the bed groaning under him and the sheets hissing as he fought against them. But he was not going to get, be able to get to me because his matchless coordination was gone. He could not even get up from the bed. I want to fix your leg up, I said crazily, but in a perfectly natural tone of voice, which made my words sound even crazier, even to me. You'll fix my, and he arched out, lunging hopelessly into the space between us. He arched out and then fell, his legs still on the bed, his hands falling with a loud slap against the floor. Then after a pause, all the tension drained out of him and he let his head come slowly down between his hands. He had not hurt himself, but he brought his head slowly down between his hands and, re and rested it against the floor, not moving, not making any sound. I'm sorry, I said blindly. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I had just control enough to stay out of his room, to let him struggle back into the bed by himself. I slid down from the window and I remember lying on the ground, staring up at the night sky, which was neither clear nor overcast. And I remember later walking alone down a rather aimless road, which leads past the gym to an old water hole. I was trying to cope with something that might be called double vision. I saw the gym in the glow of a couple of outside lights near it, and I knew, of course, that it was the Devon gym, which I entered every day. It was, and it wasn't. There was something innately strange about it, as though there had always been an inner core to the gym, which I had never perceived before, quite different from its generally accepted appearance. It seemed to alter moment by moment before my eyes, becoming for brief what flashes a totally unknown building with a significance much deeper and far more real than any I had noticed before. The same was true of the water hole where unauthorized games of hockey were played during the winter. The ice was breaking up on it now with just a few glazed islands of ice remaining in the center and a fringe of hard surface glinting along the banks. The old trees surrounding it all were it intensely meaningful with a message that was very pressing and entirely indecipherable. Here, the road turned to the left and became dirt. It proceeded along the lower end of the playing field, and under the pale light, night glow, the playing field swept away from me in slight frosty undulations, which bespoke meanings upon meaning, levels of reality I had never suspected before, a kind of thronging and epic grandeur which my superficial eyes and cluttered mind had been blind to before. They unrolled away impervious to me as though I were a roaming ghost, not only tonight, but always, as though I had never played on them a, a hundred times, as though my feet had never touched them, as though my whole life at Devon had been a dream, or rather that everything at Devon, the playing fields, the gym, the water hole, and all the other buildings and all the people there were intensely real, wildly alive and totally meaningful. And I alone was a dream, a figment which had never really touched anything. I felt that I was not, never had been, and never would be, a living part of this overpoweringly solid and deeply meaningful world around me. I reached the bridge which arches over the little Devon River and beyond it the dirt track which curves toward the stadium. The stadium itself, two white concrete banks of seats, was as powerful and alien to me as an Aztec ruin, filled with the traces of, unvanished, of vanished people and vanished rights, of supreme emotions and supreme tragedies. The old phrase about if these walls could only speak occurred to me and I felt it more deeply than anyone has ever felt it. I felt that the stadium could not only speak, but that its words could hold me spellbound. In fact, the stadium did speak powerfully and at all times, including this moment, but I could not hear, and that was because I did not exist. I awoke the next morning in a dry and fairly sheltered corner of the ramp beneath, underneath the stadium. My neck was stiff from sleeping in an awkward position. The sun was high and the air refreshed. I walked back to the center of the school and had breakfast and then went to my room to get a notebook because this was Wednesday and I had a class at 9.10. But at the door of the room, I found a note from Dr. Stanpole. Please bring some of Finney's clothes and his toilet things to the infirmary. I took his suitcase from the corner where it had been accumulating dust and put what he would need into it. 
I didn't know what I was going to say at the infirmary. I couldn't escape a confusing sense of having lived through all of this before. Phineas in the infirmary and myself responsible. I seemed to be less shocked by it now than I had the first time last August when it had broken over our heads like a thunderclap in a flawless sky. There were hints of much worse things around us now, like a faint odor in the air, evoked by words like plasma and psycho and sulfa, strange words like that ended like that with endings like Latin nouns. The newsreels and magazines were choked with images of blazing artillery and bodies half sunk in the sand of a beach somewhere. We members of the class of 1943 were moving very fast toward the war now, so fast that there were casualties even before we reached it. A mind was clouded and a leg was broken. Maybe these should be thought of as minor and inevitable mishaps in the accelerating rush. The air around us was filled with much worse things. In this way, I tried to calm myself as I walked with Finney's suitcase toward the infirmary. After all, I reflected to myself, people were shooting flames into caves and grilling other people alive. Ships were being torpedoed and dropping thousands of men in the icy ocean. Whole city blocks were exploding into flame in an instant. My brief burst of animosity lasting only a second, a part of a second, Something which came before I could recognize it and was gone before I knew it had possessed me. What was that in the midst of this Holocaust? I reached the infirmary with Finney's suitcase and went inside. The air was laden with hospital smells, not unlike those of the gym, except that the infirmary lacked that sense of, the, of spent human vitality. This was becoming the new background of Finney's life, this purely medical element from which bodily health was absent. The corridor happened to be empty, and I walked along it in the grip of a kind of fatal exhilaration. All doubt had been resolved at last. There was a wartime phrase coming into style just then, this is it. And although it later became a parody of itself, it had a final flat accuracy, which was all that could be said at certain times. This was one of the times, this was it. I knocked and went in. He was stripped to the waist, sitting up in bed, leaving through a magazine. I carried my head low by instinct, and I had the courage for only a short glance at him before I said quietly, I've brought your stuff. Put the suitcase on the bed here, will you? The tone of his words fell dead center without a trace of friendliness or unfriendliness, not interested and not bored, not energetic and not languid. I put it down beside him, and he opened it and began to look through the extra underwear and shirts and socks I had packed. I stood precariously in the middle of the room, trying to find somewhere to look and something to say, wanting desperately to leave and powerless to do so. Phineas went carefully over his clothes, apparently very calm, but it wasn't like him to check with such care, not like him at all. He was taking a long time at it, and then I noticed that as he tried to slide a hairbrush out from under a flap, holding it in the case, his hands were shaking so badly that he couldn't get it out. Seeing that released me on the spot. Finney, I tried to tell you before. I tried to tell you when I came to Boston that time. I know, I remember that. He couldn't, after all, always keep his voice under control. What did you come around here for last night? I don't know. I went over to the window and placed my hands on the sill. I looked down at them with a sense of detachment as though they were hands somebody had sculptured and put on exhibition somewhere. I had to, then I added with great difficulty. I thought I belonged here. I felt him turning to look at me, and so I looked up. He had a particular expression which his face assumed when he understood, but didn't think he should show it, a settled, enlightened look. It, its appearance now was the first decent thing I had seen in a long time. He suddenly slammed his fist against the suitcase. I wish to God there wasn't any war! I looked sharply at him. What made you say that? I don't know if I can take this with a war on. I don't know. If you can take... What good are you in a war with a busted leg? Well, you, why, well, there are lots. You can, he bent over the suitcase again. I've been writing to the Army and the Navy and the Marines and the Canadians and everybody else all winter. Did you know that? No, I guess you didn't know that. I used the post office in town for my return address. They all gave me the same answer after they saw the medical report on me. The answer was no soap. We can't use you. I also wrote the Coast Guard, the Merchant Marine. I wrote to General de Gaulle personally. I also wrote Chiang Kai-shek and I was about ready to write somebody in Russia. I made an attempt at a grin. He wouldn't like it in Russia. I'll hate it everywhere if I'm not in this war. Why do you think I kept saying there wasn't any war all winter? 
I was going to keep on saying it until two seconds after I got a letter from Ottawa or Chungking or someplace saying, yes, you can enlist with us. A look of pleased achievement flickered over his face momentarily as though he had really gotten such a letter. Then there would have been a war. Finny, my voice broke, but I went on, Phineas, you wouldn't be any good in the war, even if nothing had happened to your leg. A look of amazement fell over him. It scared me, but I knew what I said was important and right, and my voice found that full tone voices have when they are expressing something long felt and long understood and released at last. They'd get you someplace at the front, and there'd be a lull in the fighting, and the next thing anyone knew, you'd be over with the Germans or the Japs asking if they'd like to field a baseball team against your, our side. You'd be sitting in one of their command posts, teaching them English. Yes, you'd get confused and borrow one of their uniforms, and you'd lend them one of yours. Sure, that's what, just what would happen. You'd get things so scrambled up, nobody would know who to fight anymore. You'd make a mess, a terrible mess, Finny, out of the war. His face had been struggling to stay calm as he listened to me, but now he was crying, but trying to control himself. It was just some kind of blind impulse you had in the tree there. You didn't know what you were doing. Was that it? Yes, yes, that was it. Oh, that was it, but how can you believe that? How can you believe that? I can't even make myself pretend that you could believe that. I do. I think I can believe that. I've gotten awfully mad sometimes and almost forgot what I was doing. I think I believe you. I think I can believe that. Then that was it. Something just seized you. It wasn't anything you really felt against me. It wasn't some kind of hate you felt all along. It wasn't anything personal. No, I don't know how to show you. How can I show you, Finny? Tell me how to show you. It was just some ignorance inside of me, some crazy thing inside of me, something blind, that's all it was. He was nodding his head, his jaw tightening and his eyes closed on the tears. I believe you, it's okay because I understand and I believe you. You've already shown me and I believe you. The rest of the day passed quickly. Dr. Sample had told me in the quarter that he was going to set the bone that afternoon. Come back around five o'clock, he had said, when Finney should be coming out of the anesthesia. I left the infirmary and went to my 1010 class, which was on American history. Mr. Patchwithers gave us a five minute written quiz on the necessary and proper clause of the constitution. At 11 o'clock, I felt the building, I left the building and crossed the center common where a few students were already lounging, although it was still a little early in the season for that. I went into the first building, walked up the stairs where Finney had fallen and joined my 1110 class, which was in mathematics. We were given a 10 minute trigonometry problem, which appeared to solve itself on my paper. At 12, I left the first building, recrossed the common and went into the Jared Cotter building for lunch. It was a breaded veal cutlet, spinach, mashed potatoes and prune whip. At the table, we discussed whether there, were, there was any saltpeter in the mashed potatoes. I defended the negative. After lunch, I walked back to the dormitory with Brinker. He alluded to last night only by asking how Phineas was. I said he seemed to be in good spirits. I went on to my room and read the assigned passages, pages of Le Bourgeois Gentlehome. At 2.30, I left my room and walking along one side of the oval Finney had used for my track workouts during the winter, I reached the far common and beyond it, the gym. I went past the trophy room, downstairs into the pungent air of the locker room, changed into gym pants and spent an hour wrestling. I pinned my opponent once and he pinned me once. Phil Latham showed me an involved, an involved method of escape in which you ex executed a modified somersault over your opponent's back. He started to talk about the accident, but I concentrated on the escape method and the subject was dropped. Then I took a shower, dressed, and went back to the dormitory, reread part of Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme, and at 4.45, instead of going to a scheduled meeting of the Commencement Arrangements Committee, on which I had been persuaded to take Brinker's place, I went to the infirmary. Dr. Stanpole was not patrolling the corridor as he habitually did when he was not busy. So I sat down on a bench amid the medical, medical smells and waited. After about 10 minutes, he came walking rapidly out of his office, his head down and his hands sunk in the pockets of his white smock. He didn't notice me until he was almost past me and then he stopped short. His eyes met mine carefully and I said, well, how is he, sir? In a calm voice, which the moment after I had spoken alarmed me unreasonably. Dr. Stanhole sat down next to me and put his capable looking hand on my leg. This is something I think boys of your generation are going to see a lot of, he said quietly, and I will have to tell you about it now. Your friend is dead. 
he was incomprehensible, I felt an extremely cold chill along my back and neck, that was all. Dr. Stanpole went on talking incomprehensibly. It was such a simple, clean break. Anyone could have said it. Of course, I didn't send him to Boston. Why should I? He seemed to expect an answer from me, so I shook my head and repeated, why should you? In the middle of it, his heart simply stopped without warning. I can't explain it. Yes, I can. There is only one explanation. As I was moving the bones, some of the marrow must have escaped into his bloodstream and gone directly to his heart and stopped it. That's the only possible explanation. The only one. There are risks. There are always risks. An operating room is a place where the risks are just more formal than in other places. An operating room and a war. And I noticed that his self-control was breaking up. Why did it have to happen to you boys so soon here at Devon? The marrow of his bone, I repeated aimlessly. This at last penetrated my mind. Phineas had died from the marrow of his bone flowing down his bloodstream to his heart. I did not cry then or ever about Phineas. I did not cry even when I stood watching him being lowered into his family's straight-laced burial ground outside of Boston. I could not escape a feeling that this was my own funeral, and you do not cry in that case. Okay, so let's talk about the literary analysis coming your way.